Chapter 9 How Soon They Forget Biazi mevole narciso. Our operations mandate extreme caution to be executed in a discreet, escapable manner. Yet you unilaterally decided to risk global attention? There will be inquiries, to be sure, and these authorities will not simply go away. Everything cannot be sanitized. How do you explain it, Narciso? Esposito's eyes suddenly wrenched to steel gray and squinted. Might I remind his eminence there was no way to anticipate Dr. Miller's improbable confederation with an embedded brownstone operative? Improbable? Spada Sacra do not believe in the folly of chance. Obviously, this operator is a spy. Fortuity aside, your eminence, we could not predict such an alliance. This is not important, my son. What is important is that others are not aware of us. You had those imbeciles masquerading around with identifiable weaponry. This was a prerogative mandated by the fac officier, eminence. A harlequin! We decide not him. There will be questions, and it will only be a function of time before hibernating bears awaken. Where are they now? Esposito grinded teeth. His ascension to Spadasakra's second-in-command was one of the fastest in the organization's recorded history, yet his ego was constantly checked by his master in a show of titled superiority, and he savored the succession that would come soon enough. Sooner, if necessary. According to our sources, heading to the city of San Francisco. That is not what I asked, Narciso. We do not have a current location, although... Find them. Bring the scientists to me, and do not lose the device this time. Yes, your eminence. Daddy, I'm hungry. Matt turned around and looked at Emily with complete astonishment. How could she possibly want anything to eat after all that? He wondered. Chris checked the rearview mirror and saw Emily pointing towards her mouth. Snickers was sitting up, panting heavily from the hot vinyl seats. His hair was slightly longer than a purebred Labrador's, evidence of a golden mix, and wind blasting through the open windows created a swirling hairstorm. Chris checked the fuel gauge. There's a gas station ahead at the Sand Hill exit. We should probably stop. His rabbit bickered with every incline, only to befriend the valleys some moments later. It soon rambled across an overpass traversing the two-mile-long Stanford Linear Accelerator. San Francisco's suburbs lay just beyond. Interstate 280, better known as the Junipero Serra Freeway, was named to honor a Spanish Franciscan friar that founded many of the area's missions predating the American Revolution. The friar achieved notoriety not only from his mission work, but chiefly because he endured his later travels in debilitating pain due to a leg injury incurred after falling off a mule. Choked with fast-moving traffic and constant undulations, the Junipero showed no mercy for the tired rabbit. Its temperature gauge started to climb. Frustrated drivers were forced to overtake the decelerating heap, shaking their heads as they passed. Friar Sarah wouldn't be the last pilgrim to limp on this trail. It became obvious to Chris that his car needed a break before it overheated. He exited the interstate and proceeded east for a mile before locating the first service station. As soon as they stopped at a diesel pump, both men jumped out of the car. Chris immediately reached for his wallet and pulled out a debit card, inserting it into the pump's validator. Matt, still sluggish from his injury, looked up and saw Chris pulling the card out of the machine. No! He yelled across the car's roof. What? Stunned, Chris took his hand off the pump handle. Ah, my fault! I should have warned you. Now they know exactly where we are, and our direction. Sorry, I didn't think about this. Just remembered. Huh? How? Matt pointed to the card. Doubtful they have someone right around the corner, but they probably have the capability to have someone intercept us within 10 to 15 minutes, or less. We need to leave, and I mean very soon. Oh, God. I didn't think about that. You're right. I should have used cash. Chris reached into his front pants pocket and found over $100 in mixed bills. That amount was far less than needed for the journey to D.C., Matt concluded. Chris, look, that's my fault. I have to assume they know we're here already, so it won't matter if we swipe our cards. They can't know where we're ultimately going. Oh, jeez, Matt had another revelation. How could I be so stupid? Our phones! 
What about them? Matt suddenly remembered his was likely destroyed along with his Mustang. Turn yours off. They'll triangulate your signal if it's turned on. Oh, for the love of... Chris fumbled for his phone and shut it off in a panic. He quickly regained his composure and returned to their immediate problem. We'll need cash, Matt. As much as we can get. Exactly. Matt reached back for his wallet and handed Chris his bank card. Here, take this. There's a $500 limit on this card, so max it out. The pin is 0824. Got it? Do the same with your card. I will finish refueling while you take care of that and your daughter. Do it quickly. We don't have all day. Got it. Come on, Em. Chris knocked on Emily's window and motioned her to come along. She opened the door and Snickers immediately jumped over her and onto the pavement, running towards a hedgerow between the parking lot and the main road. Before he made it, the dog ran directly into the path of a circling car. The driver slammed on the brakes and laid on their horn. Emily chased Snickers and attracted the stern caution of a panicky old lady who could barely see over her steering wheel, yet was able to leer through her window and thrust a bony finger. Keep that dog on a leash, young lady. Ignoring her, Emily continued across to capture Snickers, who, as it turned out, only meant to relieve himself. Emily called Snickers back to the curb afterwards. The lab shimmied to her side where he sprawled on the pavement, his mouth wide open, panting heavily, and his tongue unfurled in a waterfall of bouncing flesh. The beldam driver raised her nose and huffed away, revealing Chris racing inbound. Come on, let's take Snickers back to the car so we can get something to eat, okay? Emily grabbed the collar and struggled to coax Snickers back in the car. He weighed considerably more than her and leveraged it to his advantage. After a few failed attempts, she eventually convinced him that the rabbit's vinyl seats were better than the scorching asphalt. Snickers sniffed the rear seat and climbed aboard, draping himself across the shady side of the bench. Emily closed the door and joined her father as they entered the store. Chris noticed an ATM located on the back wall by the restrooms. He relocated his debit card, swiped it past the reader, and entered his pen. After a prompt, he selected the maximum $500 allowed and waited. That's one thing going right today, at least, he mumbled. He stuffed the cash and his wallet in a pants pocket, and then reached into his other pocket, producing Matt's card. He swiped it, and the machine prompted for the pen. Chris paused a second to recall the number. 0824, Emily blurted without hesitation. Chris turned around, astonished. But she rolled her eyes, mouthing the words to a song in a smug display. Chris continued with the transaction and waited for the cash. Another $500 appeared from the dispenser below the screen. Surely $1,000 would get them to D.C., he thought. Gas, food, lodging? It's only three days away, maybe just two, or even less if they didn't stop. A bit more reality was settling in than Chris desired. Walking over to the fresh food section, he and Emily stared incredulously at some hot dogs that had slowly atrophied to wrinkled twigs. Sandwich? Chris rummaged a nearby cooler. Emily nodded and looked at them. She selected a thick bologna and cheese on white bread sandwich. Chris grabbed two turkey and Swiss on wheat sandwiches and then snagged some chips and a few candy bars on the way to the dog food. I don't believe it. What? Emily asked. Look. They have leashes. Next to the dog food was a small selection of pet needs, including a few short nylon dog leashes. Chris added a six-foot blue leash, a can opener, and four large cans of dog food to his overestimated cradle. His arms took notice. Returning to the cooler, he and Emily nabbed some soft drinks and two liters of cheap bottled water. With the ability to carry no more, Chris and Emily brought their comestibles to the counter. When it came time to pay, Chris reached for his wallet to retrieve his debit card. He paused, then handed the debit card to the cashier. We're still in the same place. Why use the cash now, he thought. The clerk bagged everything and completed the transaction. Chris handed Emily her soda, and they returned to the car. Matt had completed the refueling and sat in the back, playing with Snickers. Emily opened her door and climbed inside. Snickers assailed her, investigating all the new smells her clothes picked up from the store. Chris handed the grocery bag to Matt, who began inspecting its contents. What did you bring me? Chris jumped in the driver's seat and started the engine. A turkey sandwich and chips. You can have water or one of the sodas. I'm saving one bottle of water for the dog. 
Chris handed him his debit card and his $500. Thanks. We'll make it. Don't worry. Matt removed one of the dog food cans and turned around to Emily, grunting a little from the wounded shoulder. See what your daddy brought you? No, she replied as she pushed his shoulder away. Where's my sandwich? Matt winced. Let me guess. He pulled out the sandwich with the white bread and held it in front of Emily. You got the bologna, didn't you? Very funny. Chris steered back onto the freeway while the others dined. As soon as he settled into the slow lane's pace, Matt handed him a sandwich and a cola. Matt finished eating and cranked open a can of dog food. Making sure he didn't leave a sharp edge, he passed the can back to Emily. Snickers whined in anticipation. Continuing to devour her sandwich using her right hand, Emily held the can with her left, allowing Snickers to lap up the beef product feverishly with his gargantuan tongue. Despite the lacking horsepower, Chris managed to keep them above minimum speed limits. Matt scrutinized each passing vehicle, maintaining a high state of alert. Thirty minutes up the road, Snickers began to whimper. Daddy, I think we need to pull over. Chris looked into his rearview mirror and dismissed the situation. Even in heavy traffic, the run from Santa Clara to Fisherman's Wharf was under 90 minutes. He'll be okay, Em. We're stopping soon. Emily shook her head. He daydreamed about one of his first dates with Suzanne over a dozen years ago, catching a bus to Pier 39 for day sailing, then returning for drinks at the aquarium. He recalled being quite ill on that date. His land legs were three hours disposed before making a mess of the restroom stall. It was a supreme test in patience for Suzanne, and she passed with flying colors, patience not being one of Chris's virtues, or Matt's. The dream broke when Snickers' whimpering became out and out crying. Emily tapped her father on the shoulder. I really think he needs to go. Before Chris could reassess the situation, Snickers started convulsing. Emily panicked because she didn't know what to do, and this big dog was right next to her, uncontrollably retching. Snickers held his head just above Emily's lap, and with one major convulsion, expelled a hot combination of bile and the entire can of food he just ate. Emily screamed, feeling the warmth of the emesis across her legs. Oh, Daddy! She started to cry. Oh, dude! That's disgusting! Matt held his nose and felt like heaving. Chris slammed on the brakes and pulled the car onto the emergency shoulder. Once stopped, he jumped out and grabbed a towel from the back. He ran around to the right side of the car and opened Emily's door, allowing her to flee. Matt, get the leash and take the dog to the grass over there, would you? Ah! Uh, Sure. Matt held his nose and felt queasy. No problem. Emily squirmed as Chris wiped her down. Her pants would require more attention. He returned to the car and grabbed another bottle of water. Matt escorted Snickers far from the road and into the grass. The dog convulsed once again, launching another salvo. Matt led him away before the inevitable inspection occurred. Ugh. I think he's finished. Snickers shook his head, licked his mouth a few times, and looked up at Matt, tail wagging. Chris shifted his attention to the car's rear seat and toiled to scrub it. Using the rest of the bottled water, he managed to remove most of the foul mess. Odor accepted. A California Highway Patrol interceptor eased in behind him with his emergency lights flashing. Its driver was visible behind the windshield's glare, speaking into a microphone. Chris looked up at the officer, forgetting about the soiled towel in his hand. <clears throat> Damn it, Matt yelled in a muffled tone. What? Chris remained fixated on the patrolman. He's reporting our location. To whom? To anybody with a scanner and the ability to trace your tag. Assume those guys from the lab are listening. Chris put the towel down and started to approach the officer. Abruptly, the patrol car's public address speaker blared. Please remain where you are, sir. The patrolman pulled his cruiser onto the grass between Matt and Chris's rabbit and climbed out. He spent several moments assessing the situation, and while doing so, caught a whiff of the dog vomit. He covered his nose and turned to Chris. Sir, are you the driver? Yes, Chris replied. I'll need your driver's license, proof of insurance, and registration, please. Chris reached back for his wallet and handed the credentials to him. The patrolman returned to his car, spent a few unnerving minutes examining them, found everything in order, and returned. Do you need any assistance, Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller? It had been several years since anyone called him that, but Chris walloted his cards and fumbled for some words. Um, no, no thanks. I think we're good. 
Curious, Emily came to her father's side to have a peek inside the patrol car. The officer looked at her and smiled. She looked back at Snickers. He's sick. The patrolman looked towards Snickers' direction and nodded, catching another dose of the putrid odor. That much is apparent, young lady. He turned back to Chris. Mr. Miller, try to get underway as soon as you can. With a smile, he motored away. Chris waved and looked towards Matt. Thanks, we will. Matt looked concerned, attempting to guide Snickers towards the back seat of the Volkswagen. We need to get out of here and off this interstate right now. There's a big park about ten minutes up. Hmm, Matt paused. That will have to do. We should stay off the road for a little while. They'll have the city full of eyes. Our chances will significantly improve after dark. He let Snickers climb in and then took the front seat. Emily, still wet on her legs, reluctantly sat in her usual place. She kept pushing on Snickers' head to keep it at a distance. He thought she wanted to play. Ah, Daddy! Emily held her nose. The stench was overbearing. Oh, man! No! Matt furiously rolled his window down. Chris motioned to Emily. Roll yours down too, Em. As soon as we get moving, this will all go away. He was wrong. Emily struggled with the window crank and managed to get the glass most of the way down. Chris slowly brought the car up to speed and merged back onto the interstate. With the wind whirling hair and stench throughout the car's cabin, he winced repeatedly. Jeez! Sorry, guys. We'll be off the road in a few minutes. As the hilly landscapes passed, Chris found the exit sign he wanted. It read, Highway 1, 19th Avenue, 1 4th Mile. He maneuvered towards the left exit lanes and then continued north on 19th. A few blocks down the road, Matt spotted a service station. Pull in here! Why? Just pull in. I'll only be a minute. Chris directed the car into the parking lot. Matt jumped out and walked swiftly inside. Roughly two minutes passed. He emerged with a small bag. Opening his door and climbing back in, Matt reached into the bag and removed a can of cherry-scented car deodorizer. He opened the can and handed it to Emily. Here, place that in front of you under my seat. It'll knock the smell down. Emily whiffed the can. This smells like the school's bathroom. Matt reached back into the bag, pulled out one of those generic cardboard pine-scented air fresheners, and hung it from the rearview mirror. There, all better now? Chris rolled his eyes and maneuvered the car out of the parking lot and back onto 19th Avenue, continuing north. Rumbling past State University, the mall, and a few blocks of elder Queen Anne and Revival-styled homes, the road disappeared into the densely forested bisection of Golden Gate Park. Taking this one, Chris said. He drove the car around to Stow Lake Drive and found a parking space near the walkway leading to the top of Strawberry Hill. Come on, Em. I'll show you where Mommy and I used to date. Matt took the leash and attached it to Snickers' collar. He and his new pal followed Chris and Emily across the footbridge and up a steep hill. At the top, they found a magnificent view of the surrounding San Francisco area, including Chinatown, the harbor docks, and the tops of the Golden Gate Bridge towers. We should stay here for a couple hours, Matt said. Finding a bench, the three sat towards the west to catch some sun. The wind was a gentle, occasional wisp, letting the warmth of the city radiate over them. Emily stuffed music into her ears, and Snickers decided to take position underneath their bench. We used to catch sunsets here. You're never going to get over her if you keep digging her up, man. I don't want to forget her, or all the good times we had. I can't. Long road. I... Besides... The older Emily gets, the more I see Suzanne in her. That will always be a constant reminder. No way around it. Fine, but you could have picked any place in this park. Why here? Come on, look at it. Emotional times like this? You see that clearing behind us? There's something about this place. Calming and removed. Yet, it's in the middle of everything. You still feel connected, but at a distance. It's peaceful and it helped us. I mean, it helped me forget any troubles I may have had. Hippie? No, I'm serious. There are only a few places like this that offer the same comfort. If you say so, I do like the view. Several moments ticked by as the sun raced towards the horizon. We've been lucky, haven't we? Chris asked. Very. So, where do we go from here? What's our route to D.C.? We'll take the northern run, head to Reno, then east. I figure it'll take at most three days, maybe less if we take shifts. You able to drive? Matt lifted his left arm slightly, still flinching. We'll find out.
Emily dropped her head onto her father's lap, turning her body around to lay down using the rest of the bench. That's fine, but if you get drowsy, you'll let me know, right? Absolutely, Matt nodded. Chris gazed at the horizon as the copper giant gently dipped beneath the gray haze, ushering a crisp breeze across the hill. 